G'day everyone, I thought today we'd look at the Anglo-Saxon Christian Church. How it evolved, what was its function, and how was it organised? That's all coming up. of the Anglo-Saxon Christian Church really actually predate the whole Anglo-Saxon uh, time in England by a long, long way. It really dates back to 313 and the Edict of Milan. Basically here, Rome uh, authorised a whole bunch of different religions, including Christianity, and therefore within a few years of that edict coming through, the early kind of uh, seeds of the Christian church in modern day England had already started with migrants, with settlers, with Roman legionnaires and those kind of people, traders as well, uh, all starting to set up their Christian church. By 380, Rome had decided that Christianity was going to be the official state religion. And in 429, uh, bishops, in, in modern day England were requesting uh, assistance in dealing with pagan problems as they referred to it uh, that had begun to be a real problem in England. That indicates by the year 429 there was already a fairly well organised church uh, in England. It must have had a fair bit of respect in the rest of the world because uh, the re Christian Church takes this seriously and they send uh, a number of other Christian clerics to England to help as well as presumably uh, some kind of uh, additional military resources. We don't know very much about that but what we do know is that uh, within a relatively short period of time, we don't know exactly how much but um, a couple of battles had taken place and the Christians were victorious. Now this actually itself obviously would have, um, I guess, reinforced the importance of Christianity to some of these people uh, because they would have seen, wow, the Christian God must have been favouring us and therefore uh, that's how we've won. We know from the monk Gildas that the Christian church had been uh, not only growing but obviously continuing in various parts of England so it must have actually taken a decent route and obviously had been fairly successful. Pope Gregory I sends out the monk Augustine in the year 597. This is actually really really important um, because what had happened is Christianity in modern day England had now started to evolve in its own kind of stream of Christianity. We see today many, many, many different types of the so-called Christian church that not all of them um, follow the Roman Catholic tradition whatsoever. There's many different types of Christianity. And what had happened was the the, the so-called English Christianity at the time had evolved in its own kind of vein and seems to have diverged a bit from some of the Roman Catholic beliefs. Augustine arrives in Kent with a, a group of other monks and church clerics. He's greeted by uh, or, or taken to the residence of the King of Kent that was one of the Anglo-Saxon sort of kingdoms and he goes to see the King Athelbert, who is a pagan. And this is really quite interesting because Athelbert, although he's a staunch pagan, he's married to Bertha, who is a Frankish princess. And she is a Christian. Now, it may very well be that she had a very big influence on the king and 
Augustine is allowed to preach and he's allowed to build some churches. And so his version, if you like, of Christianity really does start to um, take hold in, in Kent. A few years later, it's interesting because Athelbert then converts to Christianity. So why is this important? Well, it's very important and it's very symbolic because what happens is the two versions of Christianity both grow at a fairly rapid rate throughout England. You, on one hand, have this kind of Celtic Christianity. On the other hand, you have this kind of uh, Roman Catholic type Christianity. And eventually, in the year 664, you have this Synod of Whitby. The Synod of Whitby is really interesting because it's actually overseen by, by the Abbess Hild who was uh, the abbess of the whole kind of Whitby area. And she kind of, um, I suppose her role was to mediate around the differences and try and negotiate some common ground and try and sort of find how can the two churches work better together? Because already you had this kind of, uh, I say conflict, it's not, obviously wasn't an armed conflict between the two versions of Christianity, but the two versions of Christianity were definitely butting heads. After this, the church itself does take a, a, a big hold and it becomes a very big part of um, the lives of all Anglo-Saxons, regardless of rank or position or place in society, whether you were a slave, a free person, a thane, or whether you were right up in the, in the, the royalty, Christianity was a huge part of life. So, let's talk about the organisation of the church. Certainly by the 11th century, and probably way before that, every town and village had either a stone or a wooden church. It was essentially required that all Anglo-Saxons would attend church at least once a week. Church was held every single day, and at least one of those days every single week would be some kind of a saint's day. And this is really important because the church was providing moral and ethical and spiritual guidance to people through the sermons. It was providing um, an oversight on things like births, deaths, marriages, special days, various celebrations and so on. Emerging from the, I guess, the Synod of Whitby was the, the two kind of um, major provinces of the church. The first being in Canterbury and the second being in York. Eventually, there were 16 dioceses throughout um, Anglo-Saxon England. That would be one in every single major town. Each of these dioceses was subdivided into a series of parishes, and every single parish had its own church. The church itself, that is the religious organisation, was divided into two separate sort of groups. You had the minor orders and the major orders. The minor orders were predominantly what we might call lay preachers today. Uh, that is to say, someone who's not necessarily employed by the church on a full-time basis, but whose role is still quite significant all the same. And these kind of lay people, these minor orders, consisted of a number of key roles, and they included trainees, doorkeepers, lectors, and exorcists. The major orders of the churches predominantly included things like the deacons, the bishops, and of course the priests. Okay, let's talk about the function of the church. What did the church really do? Well, it actually achieved a whole lot of different things. And here we see the kind of um, integration between church and politics. On politics, you really had the fundamental roles of uh, internal defence, major infrastructure, trade and international relations, those kind of things, much as you do today. The church's role was far more kind of at a ground level. As I said earlier, all levels of Anglo-Saxon society believed in God. Um, and they were very much Christian through and through. And Christianity, I guess, um, shaped... The, their, their moral kind of compass and those kind of sense of obligations. Um, so the first role of the church was basically the daily services. So there was a service held every single day and you were expected to attend at least once a week. The second role of the church was to 
collect what's called a tithe. A tithe is essentially a portion or a percentage uh, and it referred to the um, the amount of crop that someone might grow or perhaps the amount of fleece that they might be able to take from their sheep, that kind of thing. So it was designed as a means of being able to pay for their parish church and priests and provide, I guess, um, an excess that could be used to support uh, not only the poor or refugees when they were, were coming around, but you'd also have uh, a, a facilitation to look after um, maybe the fjord when the fjord was being marched through the town. The third role was education. Although most Ang Anglo-Saxons could not read Latin, they did have a degree of skill around, around maths and English that kind of thing because they had to in order to trade um, and to sell their goods it was the way the trading system worked it wasn't always a case of um, cash on delivery kind of thing you may have to owe someone money uh, and that debt would need to be recognized and therefore um, in order for that to occur you had to have some sort of a means of recording that debt Primarily though, the people who were taught Latin were either very senior members of the um, royal family and the, the royal family's kind of circle, or what's called a court, or you'd also have uh, senior members of clergy being taught Latin. And part of this is seen as each of the eldermen had at least one priest, not necessarily just for religious reasons, but those priests acted as a secretary as well. Uh, and so when meetings were held, when agreements were made, it was the priest often who was recording the agreements uh, and being responsible for those further down the track. The fourth role is alms to the poor. Alms essentially meaning a donation of money which was then distributed by the church uh, to, the, to the poor of the parish. I understand that many of us, myself included, were brought up on uh, Hollywood movies and this kind of thing which portrayed the church as a very corrupt institution um, that was incredibly wealthy and this kind of thing. Certainly during Anglo-Saxon times there's no evidence of that. Um, I'm sure corruption did exist and I'm sure wealth existed in some churches at some points but it certainly doesn't seem to really be the case that that was a, um, a standard if you like and I think that this is about the poor portrayal of um, the early medieval period by by Hollywood and, and those kind of major television shows and that kind of thing. The church certainly did not have um, anything like the authority that some people seem to think it did. The, the Anglo-Saxon church did in fact uh, dis dispense justice uh, and was certainly present at the dis when justice was distributed uh, through trials and so on, but it's certainly nothing like what happened after the Norman Conquest. After the Norman Conquest, you would be subject not only to crown law, but also to church law. So you could very well be punished twice for the same offence under the Normans. The fifth role of the church was really about looking after refugees. This didn't come in as much about really until the, the ninth century when we sort of start to see um, the bigger impact of the incursions by the so-called Vikings. So what's happening with that is that the because of Vikings are raiding and the fear that is associated with those raids then by that essentially uh, the role of these birds was that each Anglo-Saxon person lived within, roughly speaking, 20 miles of a burr. A burr being essentially a fortified town, uh, which included the major pieces of infrastructure, but it would also have uh, a, 
housing for, for lots of people as well. Within that was the, the uh, often the market and also the, the church and so on. The concept being that everyone would go to the Burr when the attack happened and that would mean that these um, the men could arm and equip themselves. I say men, predominantly it was men, but we also know that uh, the Anglo-Saxons did use women in warfare. Certainly in the earlier period, there's written laws around that. And the Burr would therefore provide protection for the remaining members of the family, that is anyone who's elderly, frail, sick, infirm, the young, the elderly, and people who just weren't capable of fighting. The last role, the sixth role of the church was often these churches, as I say, were included in the Anglo-Saxon Burr. And because the churches in the later part of the Anglo-Saxon period, so to speak, uh, they included three or sometimes four storey uh, towers on the churches, they provided a lookout position uh, for members of the Anglo-Saxon Fjord uh, and the Huskals who could uh, monitor the landscape and be alert for uh, telltale signs of uh, a Viking incursion that often being shipping or um, people coming in large numbers who were uh, you know, armed and armoured and equipped and, that and so on for battle and therefore the church bell could sound and that would alert people to what was going on. Alrighty guys, so that's a bit of a summary really, I guess, of the Anglo-Saxon church. Its origins, its roles, its functions and how it was organised. I really hope you've enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.